So welcome to this uh, week's webinar. Um, this is, we're going to be in the second kind of set of modules around uh, water quality uh, and human health uh, and um, the monitoring of that through uh, remote sensing and earth observation. Um, so our speaker today is uh, Dr. Hammerkolk, um, who gained a PhD in mathematics and natural sciences from the University of Groningen um, and Following that, um, has worked well in the Netherlands and overseas on various research projects, and joined us at Plymouth Marine Laboratory uh, in 2018. Um, she has uh, a range of special interests, including uh, photophysiology and primary production of marine phytoplankton. Um, and uh, over the last 10 years uh, or so, uh, Hammer has combined uh, laboratory experiments and field measurements uh, across the Atlantic Ocean, uh, Mediterranean Sea, Arctic Ocean, um, the Antarctic Peninsula, uh, looking at the responses of phytoplankton to changing environmental conditions. Um, and uh, then also more recently, um, she'd been looking uh, quite in depth at the role of phytoplankton in the carbon cycle and also um, looking at uh, the impacts of phytoplankton and um, other remote sensing products uh, on um, factors relating to human health, uh, especially focused on the cholera epidemics uh, in southwest uh, India. So uh, I believe today she's going to be talking about a range of topics uh, under that umbrella. So I think there's going to be discussions of uh, disease, but also flooding, uh, risk mapping and those sorts of things. So. Um, with that, I will hand over to uh, Hema for her um, talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you, TJ, for the introduction. I'm just going to share my screen. So you should be able to see my presentation now, hopefully. Uh, yes. OK, perfect. Um, so hi, everyone, and welcome. Um, I thought it might be um, nice to add to TJ's uh, background of my uh, scientific career is that I have only started using remote sensing uh, in my science about four years ago. So I was a novice at some point. Um, you have to start somewhere learning, but you can get quite far if you dedicate time to it. So hopefully my lecture will help you with that. Um, and so today I will be talking about uh, the use of multispectral remote sensing observations to monitor water quality and to map floods. And the work that I'm going to present to you today is not just my own, but there are many other scientists involved, and it's very much a, a team effort. Um, before I dive into the examples from our work and research, I wanted to start off with repeating what exactly Earth observation and satellite remote sensing is. You have had this in the previous lecture, but I just wanted to remind you in a couple of slides uh, to set the scene for the work I'm going to present. So remote sensing is the term we use for gathering information about an object or a phenomenon without making physical contact. And Earth observation is gathering information specifically about the Earth's physical, chemical and biological systems via remote sensing technologies. So Earth observation can be carried out using various platforms, including satellites, planes and drones. And I will be um, mostly talking about satellite observations today. So as you've already learned in module one of this training course, there are many satellites in orbit and around 800 of those satellites are Earth observation missions for weather, land, marine and cryosphere applications. So satellites will either have active or passive sensors and the active sensors transmit, transmit their own energy towards the Earth and measure the returning signal, while the passive sensors measure radiation reflected from the Earth's surface, such as visible and infrared, infrared light. An important distinction is that the active sensors can penetrate clouds, while the passive sensors cannot see through clouds. And I will come back uh, to this later in my presentation when we compare uh, these two types of sensors um, for mapping of floods. Uh, the satellites I mostly use in my research have passive sensors that measure the color of the ocean and other water bodies. Um, as Lauren and Anna explained before, the color of the ocean results from the interaction of incident light with substances in the water. And light can be absorbed, transmitted, scattered or reflected. 
Satellites that observe ocean color uh, were originally designed to map distributions of phytoplankton in the ocean, uh, but we now have many more applications of these satellites. And the inf information contained in ocean color does not only include the concentration of phytoplankton, but also other so-called so optically active constituents. So in this image, which I think has been shown on this course before, um, we see chlorophyll, uh, which is an indicator of phytoplankton biomass. So we see water, color dissolved organic matter and sediments. Um, and all, all these substances um, in the water have different colors that we can observe. Um, and I just wanted to share the image um, of a coccolito uh, for bloom near Plymouth, um, where I'm, I live, uh, because it's such beautiful. And it also shows that phytoplankton doesn't always uh, occur as green, but can have quite a bright blue greenish color as well. So ocean color satellites um, observe the reflected solar radiation from these different substances in the water. Um, and each of these substances in the water have a distinct spectral signature. Um, confusingly, we speak of both ocean color and multispectral mode sensing uh, when referring to this technology, with the ocean color satellites specifically designed to observe the marine environment and the multispectral satellites designed to observe the terrestrial environment. Um, these multispectral satellites are very useful for high resolution observations in coastal areas, uh, which has already been mentioned a couple of times in this in this course. Um, so we use these satellites uh, to study aquatic systems as well. Um, the clear benefit of satellite remote sensing in environmental studies is the scale. There's high spatial and temporal coverage and long time surveys are often available. And as Lauren mentioned before, the latest ocean color satellites have a spatial resolution of about 300 meters um, and observe the global oceans uh, and the latest multispectral satellites have spatial resolutions of 10 meters, um, but they revisit a uh, time is five to 12 days, uh, depending on where you are. There are also many commercial satellites available that will have finer resolution, but of course these are paid for services. Um, and so both ocean color and multispectral remote sensing satellites have been around for decades. Uh, with the first satellites uh, launched in the 1970s. Um, in the case studies on water quality and flood mapping that I will be presenting in the rest of this presentation, I will be talking a lot about four satellite sensors, Landsat 8, Sentinel-2A and Sentinel-2B and Sentinel-1A. The Landsat and Sentinel-2 sensors are multispectral images um, and they are passive sensors that are based on the technology I just discussed. Um, so there are limitations in these sensors, and importantly, we cannot see true clouds. Uh, we also use Sentinel-1 sensors, uh, which is an active sensor using synthetic aperture radar or SAR technology. And this satellite does not see the Earth as we do, or multispectral sensors do, um, but instead the signal is responsive to the surface characteristics like buildings, vegetation and moisture. And so one of the things SAR is used for is the mapping of water, uh, which is obviously really important when you study floods. Um, before I dive into the case studies, um, I wanted to talk about our study region. So the region uh, that we carry out um, our research is the Fembanot Coal Wetland System uh, in Kerala in India. And Lake Fembanat is a large lake of approximately 100 kilometers long on the southwest coast of India. Uh, the lake and the surrounding wetland area are known for its natural beauty and are protected under national and international regulations, uh, including the Ramsar Convention. Um, the lake forms a really important resource for local communities and is used for coast coastal and freshwater aquaculture, capture of fisheries, Bokali rice cultivation, tourism, uh, among many other activities. But Lake Fembanat is also under pressure from all of these anthropogenic activities, and that leads to domestic waste and sewage discharge, industrial pollution, including heavy metal contaminations and eutrophication, uh, which all lead to poor water quality and aquatic weed infestation. 
Um, in the past five years, a team of scientists from the UK and India, including myself, have been studying Lake Van Banat in relation to human health, with a focus on the environmental controls of waterborne diseases, such as cholera, which is endemic in the region. And during those five years, we've seen some major events, including the COVID-19 pandemic and severe floods in August 2018 and very heavy floods between 2019 and 2021. Um, and I'm going to discuss the effects of these events on the aquatic system in the Lake Van Bernard region in more detail um, as part of four uh, different case studies. So the first case study is focused on water quality more monitoring and was part of a project funded by the UK Natural Environmental Research Council and the Department of Science and Technology of the Government of India. And this project was called Revival. And in this case study, we looked at the effects of the COVID-19 lockdown on water quality in Lake Fembanat using a combination of Sentinel-2 and Landsat-8 data and in situ data that was collected um, as part of field campaigns. The second case study uh, was part of the same research project and is focused on the development of regional satellite retrieval algorithms for chlorophyll A and for total suspended matter. And for this case study, we used Sentinel-2 data um, and the same in situ data collected in Lake Fembanat. But we also made use of the in situ data um, that's available from NASA. Um, the third case study uh, was again part of the Revival Research Project and is focused on the mapping of febrile cholera bacteria in the environment. And Shuba already touched upon this in her presentation last week, and I will show uh, more details on the algorithms we've developed for Lake Fembanat. And so to map pathogens in the environment, we made use of Sentinel-2 data and the in situ data collected in Lake Fembanat. And the fourth case study um, of flood mapping is part of a project funded by the European Space Agency that is called WIGEN. In this case study, uh, we studied different techniques to map the once in a lifetime floods in August 2018 uh, using both multispectral observations from Sentinel 2 and the SAR uh, observations from Sentinel 1. And in this case study, we also made uh, use of local information for the validation of the satellite observations. Um, so let's start with the first uh, case study on water quality. So despite considerable efforts to protect vulnerable, vulnerable marine, coastal and freshwater ecosystems, anthropogenic activities remain one of the main uh, causes of poor water quality in rivers, lakes and wetland systems worldwide has been shown that a combination of industrial and urban pollution, over-exploitation of natural resources and climate change have negative impacts on not only the marine and freshwater organisms, but also the human populations that are dependent on the aquatic environment for their livelihoods. So poor water quality can lead to adverse ecological and social economic impacts. Uh, Shuba already mentioned uh, the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations in her presentation last week. And in relation to access to clean water and sanitation to improve human health, uh, the SDGs also address the need for sustainable development um, of vulnerable coastal regions, such as uh, the Fembanat Coal Wetland System. So um, Sustainable Development Goal uh, 14 deals with the conservation and sustainable use of the oceans, seas and marine resources and meeting target 14.1, uh, that is by 2025, so that's very soon, prevent and significantly reduce marine pollution of all kinds, in particular from land-based activities, including marine debris and nutrient pollution, will require as a first step that the quality of water in aquatic bodies is assessed in a routine manner and changes therein are recorded over time. And then target point 14.2, which is by 2020, so that's already in the past, uh, sustainably manage and protect marine and coastal ecosystems to avoid significant adverse impacts by strengthening the resilience and take action for their restoration in order to achieve a healthy and predictive ocean. This requires an assessment of the impact of human activities on water quality. 
However, it's often not straightforward to demonstrate the direct effect of various anthropogenic activities on water quality. And so during 2020, a unique opportunity arose uh, to study water quality in Lake Fembanat under reduced anthropogenic activities. Um, in the response uh, to the global pandemic caused by COVID-19, the government of India imposed a nationwide lockdown on the 25th of March uh, that lasted until the 31st of May in 2020. So during this period, uh, people were required to stay at home and most services, including transport, education, industry, fish and vegetable markets, and hospitality, hospitality were suspended, uh, with the exception of essential services. And the easing of the lockdown regulations after May 2020 occurred in several phases in India, with restrictions to services remaining in place in containment zones, where infection rates and the number of COVID-19 cases were high. So we decided to study water quality during this period of reduced anthropogenic activities using a combination of satellite and in situ observations. Um, we used five different indicators for water quality that are amenable to uh, multispectral remote sensing. Um, so the first one is chlorophyll A, which is a measure of phytoplankton biomass. Uh, then second one is total suspended matter the operational defined as all organic and inorganic suspended particles larger than 0 0.7 micrometers. And then we have the absorption by colour dissolved organic matter, which is the light absorbing fraction of organic particles that are smaller than uh, 0 0.45 micrometers. So that's dissolved organic matter. Then we have turbidity, a measure of water clarity, that is related to chlorophyll A, total suspended matter, and the uh, absorption of color dissolved organic matter. And then we have the forel ule classification of water color, uh, which ranges from blue to green to brown waters, uh, with blue waters termed as clear waters, low in suspended and dissolved materials. And these water quality uh, indicators uh, were obtained from two different data sources, um, from remote sensing observations um, and from Sentinel, uh, so from Sentinel-2 and Landsat-8 sensors, and then in situ observations. We analyzed data from 2013 to 2020, with the nationwide lockdown in India occurring from the end of March uh, to the end of May. The remote sensing observations were divided into pre-lockdown, lockdown and post-lockdown periods, with observations from May to September typically being obstructed by cloud cover due to the monsoon season. Um, we also used the full time series of the remote sensing observations to analyze long-term trends in water quality. And we had the opportunity to collect in situ samples later during lockdown in May 2020, which we then compared to samples we collected earlier in May 2019. Um, I will come back to this figure when I discuss the results, but I will provide a bit more information on the different data sources uh, first. So for the remote sensing observations, uh, we used data from Sentinel-2 and Landsat-8, uh, which were downloaded from the Copernicus um, data catalog and from the Google Earth Engine data catalog. Um, and I processed this data um, using Acolyte, uh, which performs an atmospheric correction based on the dark spectrum fitting, and it provides remote sensing reflectances. Um, and this method is based on open and free data and software, which I think is really important. Um, and I think later in this course, you're going to learn how to access the data and how to process data yourself. Um, to estimate these five testing satellite retrieval algorithms, uh, which are listed in the table. Um, so, for example, cl for chlorophyll A, I use the OC2 version 2 algorithm, which is based on the blue and green bands. And these algorithms have been validated for a variety of water types and have been used in Lake Fembanot before, uh, but their use has not been validated for Lake Fembanot. And I will briefly come back to that um, in a couple of minutes' times. 
And so uh, just to give you an example of what the data look like, the map looks show the application of the algorithms to the processed satellite data uh, with examples of the five water quality indicators. Um, so from left to right, chlorophyll A, total suspended matter, the absorption by color dissolved organic matter, turbidity, and the FU classification of water color. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we've also collected in situ data uh, as part of the revival research project. Um, so field campaigns took place between May 2018 and May 2019, uh, with samples uh, being collected approximately every 20 days at 13 different locations uh, in Lake Fembanat. Uh, which are shown in the figure on the right. And just to remind you of the scale, the lake is about 100 kilometers long. Um, so these field campaigns were quite an undertaking and it took uh, two days to sample all of the stations. And so as part of these field campaigns, the five water quality indicators were uh, measured, uh, but also many more measurements were performed, including the presence of pathogenic bacteria such as Vibrio cholera. And in May 2020, uh, the Indian project partners had the opportunity to collect in situ data. Um, so we have some additional measurements uh, during the lockdown period. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, we used existing satellite retrieval algorithms um, in this study. Um, and it's therefore important to assess whether these algorithms perform well in our study region. And normally you would validate the satellite based estimates with in situ data using a match up data set. But our efforts were limited by the amount of match up data points we had. And the spatial temporal matching of the in situ sampling days with satellite overpasses was low, with about 22 data points for Sentinel 2 um, and 8 data points for Landsat 8. Um, so we consider this too low a number of match-up data points uh, for a validation exercise at the time. But we did compare the monthly mean values of the satellite derived and in situ water quality indicators, um, of which the results are shown here. So overall, the seasonality in the water quality indicators looks similar between the different data sources, but we also see some differences between the satellite derived and the in situ water quality indicators. So for chlorophyll A, we see that higher chlorophyll A concentrations were not captured by the satellite retrieval algorithm. Total suspended matter and turbidity compared relatively well. The absorption by CDOM was overestimated by about four times, and the FU classes were lower in the satellite derived observations compared to the in situ observations. So we see that some of the satellite retrieval algorithms performed differently in Lake Vembanat compared with earlier reports in literature from other regions. And so, as part of this work, we also studied other published satellite retrieval algorithms, but these did not yield a better comparison with the in situ observations. We therefore uh, chose to use the selected satellite algorithms, considering that these algorithms have previously been used for Lake Vembanat, and considering that the results are presented as a relative change separately for remote sensing and the in situ data. Um, after completing this work, uh, we followed a modeling approach to validate and develop regional algorithms for two of the water quality indicators. Um, and I will come back to this in much more detail in the second case study. Um, so I will now show you the results um, of the study. Uh, so remember that we are looking at the effect of the reduced anthropogenic activities on water quality uh, during uh, the lockdown in Lake Fembanat. Um, so we started um, with studying the changes in water quality indicators during the lockdown in 2020 by comparing the remote sensing observations in the month preceding the lockdown with those of the first month of lockdown. And the results show that water quality improved in large areas of Lake Fembanat uh, during April uh, 2020 as evidenced by degrees, which is shown in blue in these maps, in total suspended matter, in the absorption by color dissolved organic matter and turbidity. And all of these changes led to clear waters as indicated by the FU classification of water color. 
Um, I will continue on showing results at the locations of the 13 in, the, uh, in situ sampling stations, uh, which are shown here in the map on the right. Um, we continue comparing the observed changes in water quality indicators during the lockdown period in 2020 with the same period in 2013 to 2019. And while total suspended matter and turbidity typically increases between March and April each year, during 2020 we saw some strong decreases um, at the most southern stations. Um, the direction of change was mostly similar for the other water quality indicators between 2013 and 2020. Um, we then studied the changes in water quality uh, in the in situ observations. Um, the in situ observations um, from May 2020 provided us with an opportunity to study water quality later during the lockdown where remote sensing observations were obstructed by cloud cover. And although seasonal and interannual variations exist, the in situ observations from May 2020 were compared with those collected in May 2019. So we observed lower total suspended matter and turbidity again in the southern stations in May 2020, but higher values were absorbed in, observed in the northern stations. So chlorophyll A was lower or similar in May 2020 compared to May 2019, while the absorption of color dissolved organic matter was higher at most stations in 2020. Um, and the FU uh, classification of water color was not measured in May 2020, so we were not able to address any changes in this water quality indicator from the in situ measurements. Um, having observed an improvement in water quality in Lake Feminot during the lockdown, we were interested whether this um, observation lasted. We therefore studied the change in water quality indicators after lockdown uh, measures were lifted by comparing the remote sensing observations preceding the lockdown with those from October and November once cloud cover uh, had lifted. And results showed that the observed improvement in water quality during lockdown was no longer evident. So instead, changes in water quality indicators were more variable in this post mizun period, and they were likely related uh, to the influence of rainfall during the monsoon and associated changes in the hydrology of Lake Fembanat. Um, to place the observed changes in water quality um, in 2020 in the context of longer term changes, we analyzed interannual trends in the five satellite derived water quality indicators between 2013 and 2020. Um, and this was the full satellite record available at the time. And so results show that all water quality indicators decreased at the northern locations and increased at the southern locations. And at the central locations, opposing trends were observed, with total suspended matter and the absorption of color dissolved organic matter and turbidity decreasing, and chlorophyll A and the FU classification of water color increasing over time. So this shows that, for example, for total suspended matter and for turbidity, the long-term trends in the southern station showed a different direction of change, which was positive, um, than we observed during lockdown, uh, which the direction of change was negative. Um, I showed that water quality um, improved in large areas of Lake Fembanat during April and May 2020, um, as evidenced by degrees in total suspended matter absorption by color dissolved organic matter and turbidity. A similar change was not observed during the same period in preceding years, suggesting that the reduction in anthropogenic activities associated with the nationwide lockdown in 2020 had a positive effect on water quality. High concentrations of suspended and dissolved matter in Lake Fembanat have previously been related to urban, agricultural and industrial activities and restrictions to those anthropogenic activities at specific locations may explain why the observed improvement in water quality was strongest in the central and southern regions of Lake Fembanat. A halt to transport, industry and hospitality services could have had a positive effect on water quality in the entire region, 
while the confinement of people to their homes during lockdown may have led to increased domestic waste and sewage discharge in highly uh, populated areas in the north of Lake Vembanat. Um, other processes, such as reduced atmospheric and wind-induced deposition of fine particles, may have for further contributed to an improvement um, in water quality. Although we were not able to pinpoint specific sources of pollution, our studies showed that water quality can improve substantially when anthropogenic activities are reduced. And this provides important insights into the future management of Lake Vembanat and other coastal and aquatic ecosystems. We showed that a coordinated response in reducing anthropogenic activities can improve water quality with the potential to sustain and restore the ecological values of Lake Vembanat in the future. And continuing such a coordinated response could help achieve the targets set out in the United Nations Global Development Goals and significantly reduce aquatic pollution and improve water quality by 2030. As I've shown, remote sensing observations can aid in this with free and open uh, data available at high resolutions noting that it is important that region-specific satellite retrieval algorithms are developed. And the development of such regional um, satellite retrieval algorithms for Lake Vembanat is what I will be discussing as part of the second case study. Um, as has been mentioned um, on this training course several times now, the validation of satellite-based observations is essential. In the process, we verify that satellite-derived observations are a true representation of what is happening in the field. There are different approaches to validating satellite observations, and a common approach is the direct comparison of satellite data with in-situ observations, uh, in which the in-situ data is matched to satellite observations at the same time and the same location. Um, with statistical analysis uh, of the match of data, um, we can then determine whether there's a good fit between in situ and satellite data or a poor fit. If there's a poor relationship, we then might search uh, or we might do further research uh, to develop um, and improve existing uh, algorithms uh, for specific regions of interest. Um, during the first case study, I mentioned that not all of the existing satellite retrieval algorithms that we use to study water quality in Lake Van Bonan performs as expected. And in this case study, we therefore developed regional algorithms for chlorophyll A and total suspended matter. And we follow a slightly different approach than the commonly used method that I just referred to. Because if you remember, we had very little in situ data available for matchup. Um, before I go into detail about how we develop our regional satellite retrieval algorithms for Lake Vembanat, I wanted to show you an example of a direct validation of satellite data. So in one of our research projects related to the ocean carbon cycle, my colleague Christina Kong validated several satellite-based algorithms for particulate organic carbon. And in her case, a large global data set of in situ measurements of POC was available. And she updated this data set, to, data set to increase the number of observations, which is just under 6,000 globally. Um, she then used the data from the Ocean Color Climate Change Initiative, uh, which is a long-term climate quality ocean color data set that I think TJ uh, will be talking about in some of the next lectures. Um, and she used this data set to match up the in situ and satellite data at all of the locations and times of the in situ global data set. As you can see in the middle figure, Christina managed to match up uh, just over 3000 data points, which you could then use to validate the eight different satellite algorithms for POC, uh, which is shown in the figure on the right with the in situ data on the X axis and the satellite derived data on the Y axis. And so in these results, um, Christina already re-parameterized the algorithms. And you can see that some performed better than others. And in this case, the statistical anal analysis showed that algorithm B in panel B uh, was the best performing POC algorithm at the global scale. 
Um, so this is just an example of a really elegant comparison of um, in situ and satellite data. Um, the example from Christina shows how validation and algorithm tuning can be carried out when thousands of in situ data points are available. But if you remember from the first case study, I mentioned that for Lake Fembanat, we only have between eight and 22 matchup data points available, depending on whether we are looking at Landsat 8 or Sentinel-2 data. So what to do if such a limited number of matchup data points are, are available? Um, my colleague Farinan um, followed an approach to validation and algorithm development in which modeling techniques were used to obtain the inherent optical properties and the remote sensing reflectances using both local in-situ data and in-situ data from other sources. And I uh, will talk you through his approach and the development of regional satellite-based algorithms for chlorophyll A and total suspended matter for Lake Fembanat in the rest of this case study. So in short, in situ measurements from Lake Fembanat and a database from NASA were used to model absorption and backscattering coefficients to obtain model-derived reflectances. These model-derived reflectances, uh, together with the satellite matchup data set, were used to correct satellite-derived reflectances, which were obtained from different atmospheric correction methods. And the bias-corrected satellite reflectances were then used as an input to the regional satellite-derived algorithms um, for chlorophyll A and for total suspended matter. I realized that this diagram is complex, and I will talk you through all of the different steps in more detail, um, starting uh, with the in situ data sets that Farinan used for this study. Um, so, one of the in situ data sets that we used in this study is the one I mentioned earlier for the research on water quality in Lake Fembanat. Um, just to remind you, for this data set, um, we carried out field campaigns between May 2018 and May 2019. Uh, with samples being collected every 20 days at 13 different locations in Lake Fembanat. Um, as I mentioned before, many different measurements were carried out as part of these field campaigns. And for this study, we used the concentration of chlorophyll A, the absorption of part particulate matter, and the concentration of total suspended matter. Um, and this data set contained between 162 and 228, um, so around 200 data points, depending on the variable. The second in situ data set that we used um, is the NASA Bio-Optical Marine Algorithm data set, or NOMAD, um, which is freely available online, and we used the version 2 data set for this case study. And from this data set, um, we also used the concentration of chlorophyll A and the absorption coefficient of particulate matter, uh, but we also used the absorption of non-algal suspended particles, the absorption of color dissolved organic matter, the water leaving irradiance, the downwelling surface irradiance, and the backscattering coefficient. And this data set contains between roughly 100 to 800 data points, depending on the variable. So this adds um, a lot more in situ data to our analysis than we have from uh, Lake Fembanat alone. Um, so that in situ data um, that we used in this case study, and I will continue on uh, with the satellite observations that we've used. Um, so uh, we used Sentinel-2 data in this case study, um, for which level 1c products were downloaded from the Copernicus Open Access Hub. And again, just to re repeat, this data is freely available and you can download the data through Copernicus, uh, but it's also available from cloud services uh, such as uh, Google Earth Engine Data Catalog. So for the regional algorithm development, uh, we tested different atmospheric correction methods and we processed the Sentinel-2 data using Acolyte and Polymer. Um, Acolyte is based on a dark spectrum fitting approach, while Polymer removes the atmospheric signal and estimates the water leaving reflectances using a polynomial function of the wavelength. Um, we also created a matchup data set with the in situ measurements from Lake Van Manat, and we had uh, 12 matchup data points for Sentinel-2 
um, and we had uh, that was processed with Acolyte, and we had 14 matchup data points for Sentinel-2 data that was processed with Polymer. Um, so the next step that was performed is the modeling of the inherent optical properties. Um, so that is the absorption and the backscattering. And we used both the Lake Fembenot database for that and the Nomad in-situ database. Um, I start with the absorption model. Um, so in which total absorption is the sum of the absorption from water, phytoplankton, biomass or chlorophyll A, non-algal suspended matter and color dissolved organic matter. So to estimate the absorption of these constituents in the water, different models were used that are listed in the table. And you can find the details of those models in the references. Um, the figure on the right shows the comparisons uh, of these biomass suspended matter, CDOM, and total absorption models um, from left to right uh, with the in situ data per wavelength, so wavelength from top to bottom. Uh, the in situ data um, is green for Lake Fembenot and then is gray for the NOMAD database. Um, so in general, these absorption models performed really well. Uh, we do see some deviation in the model at higher wavelengths, um, for example, in the absorption of CDOM, uh, but this did not affect the results of the total absorption model, uh, which is in the most right column, um, as the contribution of CDOM is relatively small compared to the other constituents in the water. So, I continue uh, with the particle backscatter model in which the total backscatter coefficient is the sum of the backscattering coefficient of water and that of non-algal suspended matter. And in the case of Lake Fembenot, we assumed that the backscatter coefficient of chlorophyll A is small compared to that of non-algal suspended matter, and it's therefore not included in our particle backscatter model. Um, again, we used models from literature um, as listed in the table, and more details can be found in the references listed. Um, when it came to the modeling of particulate backscatter, we faced um, a conundrum. Neither the in-situ data set from Lake Fembenot nor that from the NOMAD uh, database included all the elements that we needed um, for the back particle backscatter uh, model. The in situ data set from Lake Fembenot included measurements of the concentration of total suspended matter, which is S, and the absorption of non algal suspended matter, which is AS, but not the backscattering of those particles. The NOMAD data set included the backscattering and the absorption of non algal suspended particles, but not the concentration of total suspended matter. We therefore used the common measurement in both the in situ data sets, the non alga suspended particle absorption coefficient, the AS, to link the backscattering of non alga suspended particles, BBS, to the concentration of total suspended matter, S. And so we used the model of uh, Balasubramanian et al. Um, and for the NOMAD data set, the backscatter of non-algal suspended matter was described as a function of absorption, as you can see on the figure on the left. And this modeled uh, backscatter coefficients was then compared with the in situ data from NOMAD as shown in the figure of the right. Um, the results showed that the backscatter model was in good agreement with the in situ backscatter coefficients from the NOMAD data set at different wavelengths. Um, the modeled inherent uh, optical properties were then used in a forward reflectance model to obtain model derived reflectance values. Um, and these uh, model derived reflectance values um, were then um, matched up with the reflectance from Sentinel 2 that we obtained after processing of the level 1C data um, with Acolyte and Polymer. So the forward um, reflectance model is a function of the total absorption and the backscatter uh, coefficients as shown in the equation. And this model is applied using um, the modeled inherent optical properties from the NOMAD in situ data set, as well as the in situ data set from Lake Fembenot. 
And the figure on the right shows the comparisons between the measured and the modeled reflectances from the NOMAD data set in gray and the modeled reflectances from the in situ data set from Lake Van Benat and the satellite derived reflectance routes from Acolyte in red and Polymer in blue. So the Sentinel-2 data um, was bias corrected um, in this process. Um, so the uncorrected data is shown in the lighter blue and red colors, and the bias corrected data is shown in the darker red and blue colors. And overall, you can see that most data points after bias corrections are close to the one in one line. Um, but there is some variation. variation. Um, what I would like you to notice in this figure is that by using the NOMAD in situ data set, so um, the bullets or the points in grey, we are able to perform our comparison between modelled and measured reflectances on many more data points than we would have been able to do if we only used the in situ data from Lake Fembanot. Um, so it has huge value to use the NOMAD data set in our case. The modeled reflectances were then used to develop regional satellite algorithms um, for the retrieval of chlorophyll A and total suspended matter. And the table um, provides an overview of the tested algorithms. So to estimate chlorophyll A, which is B in this table, um, the algorithms of O'Reilly based on the blue-green reflectance band ratio and Gillerson et al. based on the uh, near reflectance band ratio uh, were examined as those are commonly used algorithms for open ocean waters and for more complex coastal waters. And then two new algorithms to retrieve chlorophyll A uh, were also formulated based on different combinations of reflectance bands and based on a multilinear model. For the estimation of total suspended matter, the algorithms from Miller and McGee and Netchat et al were tested and it was previously reported that the reflectance in the red bands can increase with the concentration of total suspended matter, especially in sediment dominated turbid waters such as Lake Fembanot. And therefore a new algorithm is also tested, uh, which is based on a polynomial relationship between the reflectance and the concentration of total suspended matter. And so the performance of all of these algorithms was tested using um, statistical analysis. Um, and the results showed that the existing algorithms for the retrieval of chlorophyll A were not suitable for Lake Fembanot, either, even after regional tuning of the algorithms. And the Gillerson et al. algorithm showed better performance with regionally tuned coefficients um, at higher chlorophyll A concentrations, but high variance remained um, at low concentrations for this algorithm. So the new locally tuned uh, multilinear regression algorithm for chlorophyll A performed the best in Lake Fembanot in comparison with the other algorithms that we've tested. And for the estimation of total suspended matter, the existing algorithms actually performed relatively well after regional tuning, uh, but the new polynomial algorithm for total suspended matter performed best in Lake Fembanot. Um, so we now have two regional um, algorithms um, that we can work with in Lake Fembanot. So as a final step, um, the best performing regional uh, satellite retrieval algorithms from, for chlorophyll A and for total suspended matter were validated using the in situ data set from Lake Fembanot. And so the in situ concentrations of chlorophyll A and total suspended matter were compared with the satellite derived concentrations from Sentinel-2. So um, again, in red for acolyte and in blue for polymer process data. Um, and we also compared this for the modeled reflectances in gray. And there's a good fit with the modeled reflectances and a reasonable fit with the Sentinel-2 reflectances with some outliers that originate from one specific day. And so the comparison um, of the atmospheric correction methods showed that acolyte was the best atmospheric correction method for retrieving chlorophyll A, and polymer was the best atmospheric correction method for retrieving total suspended matter. Um, the figures on the right show an example of the application of the selected um, regional algorithms and the best performing atmospheric correction scheme for both chlorophyll A and total suspended matter. 
uh, with examples for two, bay, uh, two days, two, two different days um, in Lake Fembanat. So our study included an extensive field campaign in Lake Fembanat that measured various water quality indicators over an annual cycle, but only a small number of matchup data points were available. Um, matching satellite and in situ data in Lake Fembanat was difficult for several reasons, including logistical issues and conflicting requirements to affect the scheduling of the field campaigns during satellite overpasses, um, carrying out simultaneous in situ measurements at 13 different stations across a 100 kilometer long lake is, of course, difficult. And the frequent cloud cover, especially during the monsoon season, limited um, satellite retrievals at those times. Um, we therefore employed a modeling approach to estimate the reflectance values based on inherent optical properties that we either observed or estimated um, from in situ observations. And the simulated reflectances cons uh, constituted a large data set of about 160 data points for Lake Fembanat that could be used to improve satellite algorithms in the region. And using this approach, we demonstrate that the locally tuned algorithms um, are performed better than existing uh, models, um, which is very promising. And uh, we are now currently working with the new algorithms uh, to continue our research. Um, the atmospheric correction of Sentinel-2 data can be challenging in complex water and uh, regions with poor uh, air quality, high aerosol content and high humidity, such as Lake Fembanat, uh, can add to that. Um, we therefore tested two different atmospheric correction methods that are known to perform well in complex situations. Um, the reflectance values retrieved from both acolyte and polymer showed a significant offset when we compared, it, compared them with our simulated in situ reflectances. Um, and the data needed spectral bias correction to bring the magnitude and spectral shape uh, to within reasonable values. The underlying cause uh, of this remains unknown, but we could speculate that the methods were unable to distinguish fully between high aerosols in the air and scattering particles in the water. We also note that the choice of an atmospheric correction method in our case depends on which variable is being retrieved. And although both atmospheric correction methods produce similar results, we, we recommend that uh, the use of acolyte for the retrieval of chlorophyll A um, and polymer for the retrieval of total suspended matter in Lake Fembanat. Um, I move on to our third case study. Uh, which is focused on the mapping of Fibrio cholera bacteria in the environment. Um, Shuba already provided many examples of how satellite data can be used for studying waterborne diseases in relation to human health. And I will focus on our own work in Lake Fembanat, where we develop a local algorithm to map the risk of Fibrio cholera in the environment uh, using one of the water quality indicators, uh, which is chlorophyll A. As I mentioned early on in my lecture, waterborne diseases are endemic in, lake, in the Lake Fembanat region, and both uh, diarrhea and cholera remain important public health problems in Kerala. Um, public health data shows at least two outbreaks per year in the past decade, but we also know from World Health Organization reports that less than 16% of cases are reported in India. And although we understand the direct routes of infection quite well, for example, through the use of contaminated water, there's much to learn about the indirect routes of infection, uh, such as those through the environment. So, for example, uh, Shuba talked about the temperature and salinity conditions in aquatic system in which pathogens such as Fibrio cholera can survive. But she also talked about the association of Fibrio bacteria with phytoplankton and zooplankton and how these variables can be used to model the risk of pathogens in the environment. In the case of Lake Fembanat, we were interested in whether we could use relationships between pathogens and environmental variables that are amenable to remote sensing to map the risk of uh, Fibrio cholera in the uh, environment. 
for this case study, um, we use the same in-situ data set from Lake Femmina that I've mentioned before. And the data was collected every 20 days between May 2018 May, and May 2019 at 13 locations in Lake Van Manat. Um, and for and in this case, for this case study, uh, we looked at the environmental variables such as temperature, salinity, nutrients. We looked at water quality indicators, including total suspended matter, turbidity, and water color. Uh, we looked at chlorophyll A and phytoplankton specific composition. Um, and um, we looked at human pathogens such as Fibio, cholera and E. coli. Um, and I would like to note here that we've been collecting more in situ data since 2021 uh, to continue our research on waterborne diseases um, in Lake Vermont. And our uh, field campaigns now extend uh, to coastal areas as well. Um, the satellite data that we used in this study uh, is again level 1C data from uh, Sentinel-2, uh, which I pro uh, obtained from the Copernicus Open Access Hub. And we processed this data using Acolyte uh, to perform the atmospheric correction and obtain the remote sensing reflectances. Um, we then used an existing chlorophyll A algorithm because at the time of this study, we did not yet develop our regional algorithms for chlorophyll A. Um, so the first step in mapping disease risk um, from satellite observations is to analyze the in situ data and studying empirical relationships between pathogens and variables that are amendable to remote sensing. So those variables can include temperature, salinity, chlorophyll A, phytoplankton size classes, total suspended matter, turbidity, water color, um, the attenuation of light. Um, so there are many potential variables we can look at. And so based on earlier results in other regions, we first studied the relationship between fibrio cholera and physical chemical conditions in Lake Vembanat, but we could not find clear relationships between, um, for example, fibrio bacteria and temperature and salinity. So we then studied um, the environmental reservoirs of fibrio cholera in Lake Vembanat, and we see that febrile cholera bacteria are almost always present in the lake um, and that there is a strong association with phytoplankton. Um, we then studied this association of febrile uh, cholera with phytoplankton in more detail by looking at febrile bacteria in the environment relative to phytoplankton biomass. And we use the presence and absence of genes of the pathogenic strains of febrile cholera in our samples to estimate the probability um, of those pathogenic strains um, in the environment uh, for set concentrations of chlorophyll A. And the figure shows the results of this analysis uh, with a positive relationship between febrile bacteria and phytoplankton in the north of Lake Vembanat and a negative linear relationship in the south of the lake. Um, I would also like to point out in this figure that the risk of fibrial bacteria in the environment is actually always high, uh, with probabilities between 50 and 100 percent. So the empirical relationships uh, between fibrio cholera bacteria in the environment and chlorophyll A that we obtained from the in situ observations were then used in combination with satellite derived observations of chlorophyll A to map the risk of febrile cholera using Earth observation, uh, which you can see an example of in this figure. So you see higher risk in the northern part of Lake Vembanat, where there is a positive relationship and lower risk, but still high, in the southern part of the lake, uh, where there is a negative relationship between febrile cholera and chlorophyll A. So, in this case study, I've shown you that in situ data can be used for the development of novel satellite algorithms. And in this case, we use the relationship between febrile cholera in the environment and chlorophyll A that is amenable to remote sensing to map the risk of pathogenic bacteria in Lake Femina using Sentinel-2 data. And I showed uh, that we observed different relationships in the north and the south of Lake Femina which might partly be explained by the differences in the environmental conditions between these two regions of, lake, of the lake. Um, there's a man-made barrier in the lake, which causes more freshwater conditions in the south of the lake and more saline conditions in the north of the lake. 
And these differences, differences in conditions are likely to support different phytoplankton communities. Um, as Shuba mentioned last week, it is known from literature that some phytoplankton species attract Fibiobacteria, whereas others deter the bacteria. So our research is ongoing in trying to understand this better and the ecology of Fibio cholera um, and other pathogens in Lake Feminot. Um, so I will now continue with the fourth and last case study on flood mapping. Um, in which we use both multispectral observations from Sentinel-2 and synthetic aperture radar observations from Sentinel-1 um, and validate the satellite observations using local information. Um, if we look at the total uh, disaster events uh, by type since the 1980s in the figure at the bottom left, we see that floods are the most common natural disasters worldwide with over 3,000 events in the last 20 years. We also see that the occurrence of floods worldwide has increased considerably in the past decade, uh, with over a doubling of events from the period of 1980 to 1999 to uh, 2000 and 2019. Um, floods are also the most common natural disaster in India, uh, with reports of no nearly uh, 1,300 deaths and an economic cost of $3.1 billion in just 2021. Um, floods can have major consequences, with the potential to destroy life, display po displace populations, break down infrastructure, destroy sanitation facilities, and impede access to food, clean, clean water, and medicine. Because of this, floods are often uh, associated with outbreaks of waterborne diseases such as cholera. Um, again, for this topic, it's important to consider the new United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, including um, SDG3 uh, for good health and well-being, uh, 6 for clean water and sanitation, and 14 for life below water. And if we look at some of the targets um, of Goal three, uh, we see that one of them aims to strengthen the capacity of all countries, in particular developing countries, for early warning, risk reduction, and a management of national and global health risks. Um, strategies for attaining um, those targets must include improved responses to flooding, and a first step in the response must be the identification of flooded areas. Um, the mapping must cover the entire entirety of the affected area, and it has to be rapid to be effective. And in this case study, uh, we present an application of res remote sensing to map flooded areas using the Vemelot Coal Wetland System as an example. Um, when we started our project on the environmental reservoirs of waterborne diseases in Lake Vemelot in 2018, the southwest of India experienced an extremely heavy monsoon season. And as you can see in the graph in the middle, rainfall was considerably higher in 2018 compared to the average rainfall uh, in the previous decade. Um, so this extremely heavy monsoon season in 2018 caused once in a lifetime floods in the Lake Vemmanat region in August, uh, with many people being displaced and over 300 lives lost. Um, this was reported in news outlets worldwide, including the BBC in the UK. And quite quickly, NASA shared an RGB image of the before and after of the floods, uh, which were based on Landsat data. And I was working with multispectral satellite images at the time, so I posed the question um, whether multispectral images can be used to delineate flooded areas. Um, to map floods, uh, we followed a quite straightforward approach based on freely available satellite images, uh, software, and existing satellite retrieval algorithms. Um, I downloaded Sentinel-2 images, again from the uh, Copernicus Open Access Hub, uh, and we processed the data using Acolyte um, to perform the atmospheric correction and obtain the remote sensing reflectances. Um, we then used existing algorithms to distinguish water from land, which I will explain a bit more later in the next, uh, in the next slide, um, and then used the threshold value to generate binary maps of water and land, 
and used several clear sky images to generate a, a base map of Lake Fembana that co covers the normal extent of the water in the lake and the surrounding areas. Uh, so the water extent when there's no flooding. Um, the flood maps were generated by determining the difference between the base map and the binary water index map uh, for a specific date. A similar process um, was followed for the Sentinel-1 synthetic aperture SAR data, uh, which is regularly used for flood mapping applications. So again, the data was downloaded from Copernicus, and in this case, I processed the data using the ESA SNAP application uh, up to, to obtain the backscatter. Um, the backscatter was then used as an index of water, and we follow a similar approach to the S2 flood mapping. Uh, to generate a base map and flood maps. Um, for the S1 data, uh, we followed the method described in the United Nations Spider Portal, uh, which I think has been mentioned uh, before, maybe during this training course. Um, it provides a step-to-step -step guide and it explains how to download the data and how to generate flood uh, maps using SNAP. And so I provide a link to this at the end of my presentation. I think it's a really useful resource um, and you can learn um, some cool techniques uh, just following those instructions. Um, so following those methods, um, we have studied the accuracy of the S2 flood maps uh, in comparison to the S1 maps uh, using four different water indices, uh, including the normalized different water index, the modified normalized different index, water index, the water ratio index and the automated water extraction index. And these satellite retrieval algorithms are used to distinguish water from land pixels using uh, different sets of Sentinel-2 bands, including the green, red, the near, the mirror and the swear bands. Um, all of these algorithms have been published and you can look up the equations in the references uh, from the table. Um, so just to show you uh, an example of the different algorithms after processing of the data, uh, here are the maps of the four water indices um, with from left to right, the NDWI, the modified NDWI, the AWEI and the WRI. Um, so we tested the applications of these algorithms uh, for flood mapping using multispectral remote sensing data after which we selected the best performing algorithms to address um, the mapping of the once in a lifetime floods in August 2018. And during flood events um, in 2021, we then validated the S2 flood maps in Lake Fembanot region using information on paddy field cultivation cycles in the south of Lake Fembanot. Um, so these are the results of the Sentinel-2 flood maps uh, for four different water indices, um, with from the left to the right an RGB image from the 29th of January 2018, um, a map of the water index, uh, the associated histogram with threshold indicated, um, the map of the binary water index, the base map of that specific water index, and then the flood map with in red, the pixels that are indicated as flooded. Um, so those are the pixels that are outside the regular extent of the lake. Um, what we can see is that the WRI uh, shows the least detail and the other water indices show much more detail with flood pixels indicated mostly towards the Southwest of Lake Fembanat. And we see a similar result in um, the SAR um, observations. Um, so those are from the same day, uh, the 29th of January in 2018. And then we compared the Sentinel-2 uh, base maps and flop maps uh, with those of Sentinel-1 uh, using a confusion matrix to determine the overall accuracy um, of the Sentinel-2 flop maps. And so when we do this comparison between the S1 and the S2 data, we see that the base map and the flood map of the modified normalized different water index has the highest overall accuracy. Um, we then use these um, M and the WI to map floods in August 2018, as you can see here on the left. And the main area of flooding was towards the south of Lake Fembanat. And we, when we zoom into this region, 
we can see that the flooded area on the RGB image are having a slightly more yellow color than the surrounding lands. Um, and that's also indicated in red um, in the flood map uh, in the center. We then compared the Sentinel-2 flood map um, from the 21st of August with the Sen Sentinel-1 SAR image of, the, of a day later. We didn't have uh, matching days, um, but they were close enough to compare. And we showed that the accuracy of the Sentinel-2 map is high, uh, with pixels in red indicated as flooding in both the Sentinel-1 and the Sentinel-2 data. Pixels in orange, orange indicated as flooding in Sentinel-1, um, and pixels in dark blue indicated as flooding in the Sentinel-2 data only. And so the overall accuracy of the Sentinel-2-based uh, map was 88%, and in this example of the August 2018 floods. Um, since 2018, uh, the Lake Fembanot region has experienced more extreme flooding events, um, also in October last year. Um, and we took this opportunity to validate flood maps uh, by scanning local newspapers for reports of flooding. And we could confirm that regions in the south uh, were indeed flooded areas. Um, but the regions closer to the lake were paddy fields uh, used for cultivation of rice. Um, so we know um, that those areas might have not been flooded. Um, so what we did is we selected um, 16 different uh, paddy fields and identified uh, the months and years where these paddy fields are expected to be flooded according to the cultivation calendar. Um, and so we prepared uh, masks for these paddy fields, so we can exclude them from our analysis uh, during those specific months. Uh, which allows us uh, to more accurately assess the extent of flooded areas throughout the year. So to uh, summarize and discuss, I have shown that we can indeed use multispectral remote sensing images from Sentinel-2 for flood mapping in the Lake Fembanot region. Um, although there are also limitations in the application of the Sentinel-2 data uh, because of cloud cover, um, of which an example is given here. Um, we see that there, if there is thick cloud cover, we are not able to map um, the M and the uh, WI or the flooded region correctly. Uh, nevertheless, we consider flood mapping using multispectral remote sensing data a valuable addition to the existing technique based on the SAR data, with Sentinel-2 images available every five days for Lake Fembanot and Sentinel-1 images only available every, um, I think it's now 20 days. Um, so the use of Sentinel-2 data increases the temporal resolution considerably. Um, another benefit of the Sentinel-2 data is that we can simultaneously map water quality, as I've shown in the first case study, and also map waterborne diseases, as I have shown in the third case study, and both can provide important additional information in response to natural disasters. If you are interested in finding out more about our work in Lake Fembanot, our team has published a couple of papers related to water quality and waterborne diseases in a special issue in remote sensing, uh, which was focused on earth observations and sustainable development in marine and freshwater systems. Um, the work on water quality has been published in this special issue. So if you want to find out more about the methods used uh, or the results, then please have a look at the, at the special issue. And I think the work from Anas um, on the cholera algorithms and the observations of cholera in Lake Fembanot has also been published in that special issue. And as I mentioned before, if you want to do some flood mapping in your own region, I would advise you to start with Sentinel-1 method and follow the step-by-step -step guides on the UN Spider portal, uh, which is a really good resource. Um, and then, um, as I mentioned at the start of my lecture, the work I presented today has been carried out by a large team of scientists and students. And I would hereby uh, like to thank all of them for their contributions. Uh, contributions. Some of them are in the panel, um, so hopefully they can help me with answering some questions. 
Um, and that's all it. Thank you for listening. Um, and please feel free to ask questions in the chat if you haven't done so already. Thank you very much, uh, Helen. <clears throat> um, so as usual, um, I will answer a couple of technical questions first, and then we'll move on to the, the science stuff, the, uh, the the content of the talk. So there was a couple of quick um, questions about attendance of uh, certificate uh, of attendance and how do you get hold of that? Um, so we are logging attendance at all of these webinars. So by being here, you are your attendance is noted uh, automatically. Um, and then towards the, well, at the end of the series, uh, basically we can um, work out who has attended uh, the required number of lectures uh, and we can then send out certificates to those people. Um, so your, your attendance is being logged by the email address you've logged on with. So that's what we're using. Uh, I think that's pretty much it for questions about the webinar. Uh, there were also some questions on where to access the previous lectures. Uh, I believe we've put links into the chat uh, at the appropriate time. Uh, about that. So that's all on YouTube um, if you search for at Trevor Foundation. Okay, so um, I think if we go through the questions roughly in the order of the topics that you covered. Um, first, uh, and again, I would welcome uh, comments from the whole panel, not just uh, hammer on this. Um, so there were some questions around uh, the EO data that you were using um, and some of the data sets that you showed early on. So um, one of the first questions was the uh, POC estimates that you showed from satellite. Um, there was a query about how those were estimated and if it's available um, publicly, perhaps through something like Siemens or some other service. Um, yeah, so POC, particulate organic carbon, I think that refers to Christina's work, presumably. Um, so that's part of um, one of our uh, projects on the ocean carbon cycle and uh, that data is available on CEDA, um, it's archived, um, so maybe I can put a link in the in the chat at some point when I have time. Um, so yeah, um, so that's freely available. So uh, our POC product is available, but you will also be able to find POC products um, at NASA, for example, or other sources. Um, I think those global products are definitely available. Okay. Um, there were also questions around, um, so when you were talking, I think about the um, Central 2 data that you were using, and uh, there was a, a query about, um, had you observed issues with adjacency effects? Uh, we also had a couple of questions around seeing uh, masking when people were using acolyte themselves. Um, so I guess that, that could also be related to things like adjacency effects. Um, I guess that would be somewhat band specific. So especially if you're looking at the SWIR and NIR, uh, you might see different um, proximity at which the adjacency effects become important. But I don't know if you wanted to, to talk about that at all. Yeah, so um, I have um, used the standard uh, processing settings, mostly from Acolyte, um, which, um, which deals with that. So it masks several things. Um, what we found increasingly, uh, with working especially with the cloud masking of Acolyte, that it's very rigorous. Um, so if we look at an image, an RGB image, um, for example, in March in Lake Feminat, you will see high clouds, uh, but you can still quite clearly see the colors, you see the lake. Um, so from a sort of visual inspection, we think, okay, maybe there's not so much cloud cover, but we often get acolyte um, masking the whole lake uh, because of cloud cover. Um, so this is one of the things I'm currently like thinking about um, is to play around with the types of masking in Acolyte. Um, you have the options to turn on and off all of the masking in Acolyte. Um, you can change the thresholds of the masking so you can play around with that. Um, and the recent Sentinel-2 data also comes with um, two types of cloud masks. Um, in the data file itself, um, so that can be used um, as well. Um, I can add to that if 
helpful. Um, yeah. it, you said, the so it follows on really nicely from what you just said about the recent version of the Sentinel-2 data at level one. The older versions of Acolyte, for example, if you turned on a glint correction, would also just mask out the pixels. So the more recent versions of Acolyte are also a bit more agile at actually correcting things that they mm -hmm. used to just mask. So it's also just being aware of the version that you have. And as Gemma said, the things that you've turned on and off might contribute to some of those pixel, pixels being masked or not. Yeah. Um, but you, it's not a black box. You actually have control over that in your um, config file. Yeah, so there was, there was a question on uh, that was quite broad on what, what are the criteria when you're selecting your um, atmospheric correction method? And I think that comes back, as we've said in a number of these lectures, really it depends on the application and it depends on how much, so the, with the flagging and the masking, it very much depends on how, um, what level of quality you need to retain in the data. So if you're, if you're applying a binary flag, and it's quite a strong separation between two things, then maybe you can let a little bit more data through. If you're looking for a continuous variable um, where noise might become more of a problem or cloud edge effects might do very odd things for, with cloud shadows and such, um, then you have to be more stringent. So we can't prescribe a, a single configuration that's perfect for everyone. Um, I wish there were one, but uh, it's just not possible. Um, so I think all we can advise is that um, you read in the you read the documentation uh, where possible. Get hold of an expert or someone who's done it before, uh, perhaps for a similar region, and ask them. Um, but yeah, exactly those sorts of factors around how much you want to mask. Um, I mean, for example, one of the default masks we use a lot of the time is the land mask. Well, if you use that and you're trying to look at the flooding of land, you won't see anything. Yeah. So it's very, very um, uh, application specific. Uh, so um, there are some recommended flags, which uh, if you're just doing tests, it's very good to leave on. But after that, you can, you can begin to question uh, which ones you might want to or not use. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah. I would add to that just experiments. I mean, with Acolyte, there's so many options that you can turn on and off and just experiment and look at the, uh, the results that you get. Mm -hmm. Um, one I, I found recently with Acolyte is so you can output um, row W for the water reflectance, but also row S, which is the surface reflectance. Um, and because of the adjacency effects um, near land, the row W is, particularly in the sphere, um, the row W is more masked than the row S, even though often the values are very, very similar. And obviously, in areas with some glint, the row S would be significantly higher than the row W. So again, it depends uh, how aware you are of other sources of contamination uh, or signal. And um, so, yeah, you, you can you can change a lot and look at uh, different things, but just be aware of what you're doing as you do it. And one last thing, there is a really, really extensive handbook that comes with Acolyte. And mm -hmm. really, so what, what TJ is talking about right now, row W, row S, all of that is explained in detail in the handbook, and if you follow that, really, um, I, I think you'll you'll be able to find your way. We had a number of questions around uh, when you were talking about the algorithms and uh, the products. So one was where you showed your plots of um, CDOM and chlorophyll, uh, and uh, I believe uh, FU uh, index um, between the in situ measured and the satellite. And there was quite a marked difference uh, with the CDOM. And someone was asking if you knew why that might be the case and if it was related perhaps to the atmospheric correction. Um, because the, the bit that interested me was um, that uh, it was showing that you were, I believe, overestimating CDOM, which normally gives the water a brown color. But if you looked at the Forel Ouz, Ouz scale, uh, you were at lower values, which normally mm -hmm. suggest poor waters. So I was a little, I did, at first I thought, well, maybe the reflectance uh, is just outputting something wrong and it's overestimating, or it could be related to something like the assumed slope of the CDOM absorption. I was wondering if you had any, if you dug into that a little further. Um, not in much detail. Um, I think the algorithm that we used was parameterized for inland lakes. I can't remember the location. I can't remember the location exactly. Um, when I, when I decided on which algorithms to use, I used the ones that were previously used in Lake Vaminot, were published. Um, 
And so we know we knew the absorption of CDOM algorithm was it's not parameterized for the region, um, and it clearly showed much higher values. So we knew uh, that wasn't that wasn't correct. Um, but we didn't have the data to uh, do a local algorithm for that. Um, so I think that's the parameterization of the algorithm that made that difference um, so big. Okay. Um, so while we're on about validation, there was uh, a few questions um, around um, when you're trying to estimate this, how much time lag were you allowing between the satellite overpass and the, um, the in-situ measurement? We've talked a little bit about this before and said, obviously, it depends on your environment, um, because if it's tidal, you know, you might want to be more looking at hour overlaps versus if you're in the deep ocean, you know, a day might be acceptable. Mm -hmm. So what limits were you putting on for these validation uh, exercises? Um, so um, for the study on water quality, we just um, took the monthly means. Um, so that's very coarse. Um, we just wanted to know whether, um, well, how different the al satellite algorithms were um, from the in-situ observations. Um, just to clarify in our study, okay, we know that there are differences, um, but we're just going to look at relev relative change over time and not to the actual values. Um, for the work that Farinan has published, um, I think we've chosen um, a period that as close um, as possible. Um, I can't remember exactly what the time period was, but it must have been one or two days um, between the satellite overpass and the in situ sampling. Um, Jim, I think it's about four plus or minus four hours. I, because of the is? question, I just checked it. Oh, OK. Yeah. OK. Because we initially discussed, because our field campaigns, the data were collected over two days yeah. because it's such a large area. So it was quite challenging to find the match up data yeah. over a really short period of time. Yeah, but think... then Farinan managed to do it in quite a narrow window yeah. because it's very changeable, uh, the yeah. system. We have incoming tides incoming rivers yeah but that, that's uh, so uh, yeah i think that's what we settled on finally yeah and that would also explain why we started with close to 200 observations and yeah. we ended up with about 10 matchups yeah which is uh, always heartbreaking but that's yeah. <laughs> what you have yeah so talking of the the work with Vernon and um there was a few questions around um the model the forward model um that was used. Um, so there was just a few questions about um, was it tailored for uh, or is it suitable for coastal waters, inland waters? What, what was the, uh, were there any specifics around that? And also um, for that model, is it available freely? Can people get hold of it um, to use yeah. themselves? So the model is just the equation that I showed. Um, so um, the forward model uses the backscatter and the absorption. It's just an equation. And I think we assume the parameter based on literature. Um, so that's, that's just freely available. You can find it in Varinan's publication. And then um, all the steps before that, so modeling the optical, uh, the inherent optical properties, um, those are also following equations that are available from literature. Um, they're also all very nicely written up by Varinan, um, so people can find that information in the publications. Um, so it's not a model as in that it's computer code, it's a set of equations, um, and it's called um, a forward reflectance model. Okay, um, so there was, um, there was some questions around um, choosing Sentinel-2 over Sentinel-3. I mean, I, I assume the primary driver for that was because of the, the spatial scales that we are looking at um, in the coastal or in the lake uh, waters. Um, but uh, I just wondered if there was any other um, factors that you were thinking about when uh, you were picking basically the, the sensor, you know, 
also uh, potentially you know things like landsat and stuff could be uh, used in this so i was just uh, curious about the choice of yes them. yeah so um um selection of satellite data was based on the spatial resolution so the lake is 100 kilometers um sentinel tree data i think is 300 kilometers so that would the lake would be swallowed up in a pixel 300 um, meters oh 300 meters i was gonna say 300 300 kilometers doesn't make sense okay <laughs> so anyway i think it's the spatial resolution that we looked at 300 meters um is quite coarse for the lake uh, we do use um, the sentinel tree data in follow-up projects in the coastal areas um, so we have used it there um, so that yeah the main driver was the spatial resolution and then indeed so some of the later case studies i mentioned we just looked at sentinel 2 data but in the earlier study on water quality we put, we used both Landsat and Sentinel-2 data to increase the temporal resolution. So for uh, for Lake Fembanat, we have about six images per month for Sentinel-2, and we have one or two images of Landsat-8 uh, per month. Yeah, so I think coming back to Lauren's talk, the, the revisit times, you know, between some of these sensors is, is massively yeah. different. Um, so, yeah, okay. Um, there was a question I saw earlier um, about the difference between Landsat 8 and Landsat 9. Um, I'm not sure who, if anyone else here is an expert on that, but my understanding is Landsat 9 has all the same bands as Landsat 8, but it's got a higher sensitivity. It's got more um, bits of information in that scale. So for each wavelength, it can detect uh, more shades, basically, or intensities of colour. Um, but algorithms that work with Landsat 8 should also work with Landsat 9. You just have more... Um, uh, resolution, uh, basically, mm -hmm. uh, but the band should all be the same. Mm -hmm. um, there was an interesting question around um, the metrics of assessment. So you showed a number of plots where um, you were looking at matchups, um, and you uh, showed R square values. And the question was, um, is R squared the best choice? Um, <laughs> and which other metrics might be considered? I think is how I'm going to phrase that question. <laughs> Good question. Um, so I, I would say R square is an is a indicator, um, but usually uh, we use different indicators, which I think Shuba will have to help me with because I don't know them by the top of my head. But I think we have five or six statistical indicators, and we all look on them, and they all give you slightly different information uh, about the match between the satellite and the in situ data. And I think you would consider all of them um, in your decision on whether something, an algorithm or a validation is successful or not. Yeah, I think that uh, Jim is right. R square is uh, a good indicator, but not um, necessarily one that gives you all the information you want. So depending on, for example, if your range in the variables is very small, your R squared may be very bad, but that doesn't mean your answer is bad, for one example. So we also use um, root mean squared difference. Then we use bias to know if there is any systematic difference between the two. Even though R squared may be high, but you may still have systematic differences. So bias is a good one. Then you also saw in the case of uh, Gemma's flood mapping that mm -hmm. um, you can also use a confusion matrix, that's what it is called, to analyze um, digital data where you only have two numbers, zero or one, yes or no. With that kind of information, um, this confusion matrix is a good one. So. Uh, don't rely on a single statistical matrix. Look at a few of them and uh, compare them and uh, make sure that uh, you interpret them correctly. Uh, that's the best advice I think I can give at least. Yeah, I mean, even within the confusion matrix, you can have multiple different statistics. So you can have, you know, the um, the identifies accuracy versus the um, you know, so false positive, false negatives, um, yeah. different ratios of those. So, yeah, yeah there's, there's, uh, I think a, mul a multi-metric approach is usually, yeah, what's recommended. 
Um, okay, there was a question around the differences. Um, I think this was during your quest, your uh, slides on um, algorithm development and training uh, or, or tailoring, parameterizing. And there was a question saying, um, were there or are there significant differences between algorithms used for freshwater and marine waters? Um, I guess we could consider that in terms of chlorophyll algorithms or TSM algorithms or IOP algorithms. Um, but uh, just wondering if there was any big differences that the community should be aware of if they're thinking of uh, working with either lakes or, say, coastal waters. Um, I think the answer is yes. Um, so there are, for, for example, chlorophyll A is a good example. There are uh, chlorophyll A algorithms that are specifically um, designed for open ocean waters. Um, which uh, use the blue-green uh, band ratios. You then have algorithms that are more tailored to complex waters, turbid waters. So you could consider that coastal inland waters um, that use the red bands. So there are definitely differences um, in the algorithms uh, that you would use in different water types. Um, I'm sure you will talk about this as well, uh, TJ, in your talk. It, it will almost certainly come up when I talk about climate quality data uh, yeah. and trying to use the right algorithms at the right time. Yeah, yeah. so that will be so, in uh, lecture nine, I guess. Yeah. It's also good to remember that not all atmospheric correction algorithms work well in inland or coastal waters. Yeah. One of the main reasons is that many open ocean Atmospheric correction algorithms assume that the waters are black in the far red and infrared regions, which won't be true in many coastal and inland waters. So the algorithms have a high chance of failing. So you have to make sure that you choose the right algorithms for your particular case. So where here uh, Acolyte has been uh, a strong uh, performer um, because we've got land in the picture and we've got um, coastal waters. Uh, we wouldn't expect Acolyte to perform well if you were looking uh, in the clear blue waters off Hawaii or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I think we've got probably a couple more questions, um, mm -hmm. question topics. Um, there was a, a question, and this is an interesting one. So, where we talk about looking at long term trends or detecting change uh, in water quality, um, there was a, a, a point made that, um, for example, the, the, some waters have been shown to be becoming browner because of a reduced pressure from acid rain. Um, so, I think the question is uh, if there are changes detected, can we always tell whether that's an improvement or a degradation in water quality? Um, yes. may, may I? Oh, Jim, are you want oh, no. to go? Yeah, go ahead, Shua. I'll, I'll, I'll follow up on whatever you're saying. Okay. That paper referred to was one that dealt with um, water bodies across, I think, Northern America and Northern Europe. And uh, the argument was that um, the reduction in the acid rain um, changed the eco ecosystem and uh, moved it uh, towards um, a system that uh, produced more DOC. So you got browner water. So it is a um, specific case which they said in the paper, it came out in Nature, that there was this widespread change from uh, waters uh, in the color of the waters becoming darker. So because somebody produced that paper and that they showed it to be widely uh, prevalent, it doesn't mean necessarily that it would apply for your particular case. So, in other words, um, don't follow blindly what somebody said for some specific case. It's always worthwhile to invest some thinking into your studies and make sure that uh, the particular example cited is valid or not for your case and then proceed accordingly. 
Yeah, so I guess that's the case of, you know, we you are making an observation of change, but you need to understand the mechanism or the local impact uh, yeah. to really put that in context. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that was what I was going to emphasize is that every system is different. So you will see a change over time, maybe in some of the water quality indicators, but you also un want to understand why that change is happening um, before you decide whether it's for the good or not um, and what action you then might undertake. Um, um, I think one one last question. Um, there was a question around someone who was wanting to look at a very small lake, maybe four or five kilometers square. Um, mm -hmm. I know that uh, there's lakes of all sorts of sizes that can be processed. So I think um, you know we could also make reference to our colleagues working on the lakes CCI project and and Globo Lakes and those projects. Um, but I was just uh, a few comments around. Um, working really at those small scales. I mean, we can see, although Lake Vembanad is large, some mm. of the areas that you were detecting when you were doing the flood mapping are small. You know, those are small pockets of yeah. surface water. So I think that clearly shows that you can detect and uh, process small lakes or small bodies of water. Um, I was just curious if you could, could mention or talk about um, those small areas and the extra considerations you might have to take with, with smaller lakes. Um, I think definitely um, you can observe um, very small lakes with the Sentinel-2 and uh, also with Landsat-8 data. Landsat-8 data, I think, is 60 meters. Sentinel-2 goes down to 10 meters for some of the bands. So you would be able to observe lakes that are of a size of four or five kilometers. Yeah, I think you what you would want to consider if that's a high enough resolution to see what you want to see in the lake. Um, so um, for Lake Fembenot, um, it's narrow, very narrow at some spaces, but it's it's very long um, and there's quite a strong gradient in sort of the environmental variables. So it goes from uh, quite fresh water in the north to um, saline, uh, south, sorry, in the south to saline in the north. So there's strong gradients, so we can we can see things well. If you have a small lake, I think you have to consider what do you want to observe in such a small lake, and is that resolution high enough? Um, and an option, if you have the funding, is to look at commercial data. I think commercial data now goes up to one meter or even smaller. Um, so that would be an option. Or using drones to observe um, lakes, uh, small lakes, that would be another option to use remotely sensed data. All right, I think uh, that's pretty much all of the, the questions or most of the questions. Sorry if we didn't get okay. time to get get through to them. Um, but otherwise, I think, uh, thank you. I'll thank you again and thank the whole Thanks. panel.